So here we have our demo infrastructure. We have a hypervisor that's hosting a couple of support virtual machines. One of them is our continuous integration tool. Another one is a web server that's used for software deployment. The hypervisor is also hosting our target virtual machines. This is where our code's going to be deployed to. Our code and our Ansible playbooks are kept in source control management. We have a workstation editing files and committing files into that SCM. And at the heart of everything, we have Ansible, which is working as the glue. So we're going to go through a few different principles here to show what Ansible can do. We're going to show virtual machine provisioning. We're going to show configuration of those virtual machines. And we're going to show how to do application deployment. Coupling all these things together, we're going to show how simple playbooks can act to integrate all of these actions. A lot of these integrations will be happening by talking to remote APIs, and we'll demonstrate a couple of different API integrations. So let's get on with the demonstration. So here we have some windows on our demo suite. We've got the tower interface, we've got one of our target web servers already up and running and running our sophisticated application. We've got a view on Jenkins, our CI tool, and we've also got the workstation that's going to be editing our code. So first things first, let's log on to Tower as the administrator user. There's a really good detailed demonstration of Tower at ansible.com slash tower that I encourage you to go and view to see all of the details. I'm not going to cover Tower from top to bottom in this particular demonstration because this is about the glue element. I will just show a couple of things though that explain the reason why Tower is part of this demo. If I log on to this administrative user and go to the front page, there's a small icon up here that says View Activity Stream. This is one of the really, really nice features of Tower over Ansible Core. We can basically see everything that's happened. For people who are used to using Ansible Core, you will know that as soon as you run a playbook, that's it. You haven't got the output any longer. Whereas here, I can have a look and see what our dev user has been up to recently. Um, I can even link through to the job and see the details if I want. We'll come back to that in a short while. Other things that Tower helps with are role-based access control. If we take a look at the few of the links at the top here at the moment, we've got a couple of projects, we've got a whole bunch of inventories, and we've got a whole series of job templates doing different things. But if we wanted to segregate our environment and only give access to portions of, uh, say, an infrastructure that only developers should be able to access, that's not so easy to do with Core. But with Tower, that's what the products are built around. So for the rest of the demo, I'm going to come out of the admin user and I'm just going to be our dev user. So you can see one of the differences now if I flick through those menus again. The projects, there's only one project available, there's only one inventory, and consequently that means there's only a set of job templates that are pertinent to this person's job. So, one of the first things that I want to do is add a new virtual machine to our application infrastructure. And another nice feature of Tower um, is the ability to add a form onto a job template. A job template is just a wrapper around a playbook, the inventory that it targets, and the credential that's needed to access it too. So if I go to new VM and I run it, I get a nice little form come up. Uh, in this particular example, I've chosen to restrict the host names that somebody can use. So I know that number one is up, I'm gonna bring up number two. We could extend this even further to say, what sort of server we wanted provisioning. I want an app server in this particular instance. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch this job now. This will actually take a couple of minutes to run. So 
what I'll do is just speed the video up a second. Now I said in the beginning introduction that there were a number of principles that we were going to cover. There's actually something quite neat within Tower that I'm going to show as part of this bringing up a new virtual machine. Tower has the ability to present a job template with a callback URL. So a simple representation of the job template as a RESTful URL basically. This means we can do phone home tasks. In this particular example, every new virtual machine that I bring up is based on the same simple template with nothing laid on it. Um, it's a minimum use case virtual machine basically. When the virtual machine starts up though, it runs a very simple job to look up whereabouts tower is and look up what the job template is that it needs to call and it simply does a curl against the URL which will trigger the job template to run phone home post install bootstrap type job one of the things I'm going to do now is flick to the actual jobs queue because as you'll see from that poke tower thing that happened at the end. Aha, we've got a post install job running. So that was the phone home callback. If I just drop into this job, we can see this working as well. Now this callback and the way that it's locked up is all in the code that's shared on GitHub. At the end of the demonstration, I will share the URL for that so you can see all of the playbooks, roles, etc. that are used. If you want to understand how the callback code is all working, take a look at the phone home role and the script that it puts into place. If you take a look at the contents of the script, you see it's very simple and all it's doing is using DNS to find the information. Long story short, SRV and TXT records. Okay, so our post install task has finished. There are a set of stock standard things that happen. And you notice there are actually two plays here. The second play that happens is our app deployment. Now if I scroll through here, I've done a helpful display the machine IP address. And I can see that our new box is 192. So if I look at this IP address, go and look in our browser, we have the same code as on our first host. Naturally in a real world environment this would sit behind a load balancer. You could do that as part of a play as well, I leave that as an exercise to the viewer. But what if, as part of our deployment process, Tower had to ask permission of another, say, API if it was allowed to do a deployment to a host. Let's go and deploy another virtual machine. This time we'll pick number three. Now again, this is bringing up a new virtual machine. It takes a couple of minutes, so I'll actually speed things up. Now on this occasion, the virtual machine is going to come up. It's going to do the same phone home process as the last one and it's going to run the same post install playbook except when it comes to deploy the application the app deployment role will go and ask a third party API if it's allowed to deploy let's say for example it was a ticketing system and you have to set a ticket to say whether a deployment is actually permitted or not In this particular example all I'm doing is a simple curl against a web interface and getting back a value of true or false. If you look at the app role in the code repository described at the end of the demos, you will see how this particular example works. But it loosely shows the theory. Okay, let's watch the post install task running this time. Here's our job running. Let's drill into the details of it. We have a failure report, which is what we'd expect. 
The first part of the play is just doing the stock set of tasks, as in the other example. The second play is the actual app deployment. Now when I look at it, here's our failure. And if I look at the actual details to see what the message says, message deployment to TIF MM3 box was not permitted by policy. And just to show that our application is not running on that particular host, let's just get its IP address and show you there is nothing listening. Okay, that's not up and running as we'd expect. Now let's move on to look at a full end-to-end -end deployment. That last virtual machine that was brought up didn't have permission to allow the app to be deployed to it, but I've just run a job that allows it to be deployed to. Imagine that was actually a ticketing system and somebody had said, yes, you can now deploy to that host. So that's set and ready to be deployed to. Uh, just as proof that it's not been deployed to, I shall refresh the page. No, nope, it's still not there, that's good. So here's our web application at the moment, and we want to update this code so that our message is different. Here's a very simple tree of the application. It's a Python Flask app. Um, the main couple of files I'm concerned with I've already got in a Vim session here, ready, backgrounded to be uh, altered. So let's take a look. We want to change our code to say, hello folks. I'm now going to do a make test before I put my code back into the version control system because I'm a good developer like that. Oh no, it's failing its test. Hello folks does not equal hello people. That's because I forgot to update my test as well. Now, you'll notice Jenkins on the left here, there is the web app dev. Uh, if I committed this code now, that job would run and would fail, but actually I'm going to update my tests as well so everything flows through properly. Another quick make test. We have an OK. So I do a git status, there's my differences. And now I'm going to commit my code updated our application message and I shall get push at the same time. Now this is all going to flow through fairly quickly. As soon as I hit enter here your eyes need to move over onto the left hand side to watch Jenkins. First of all this job will kick in and run and that will do the tests in the same way that we've done on the command line. We know that's going to pass. This job is set to chain to the deployment job if it's successful. So what we should see is this little icon flash, then this little icon flash. You may notice down here the build executor status kicking in as well. Now, as soon as the deploy app job starts to run, this is a very, very simple job. In fact, let me show you what this comprises of. Because this is where the beauty of integrating tower with Jenkins comes in. Instead of having complicated engineering and scripts within Jenkins, all we have here is a call to tower CLI. Tower CLI, job launch, job template 102. I happen to know that 102 is our deploy job. If I just hover over this, if you look at the URL down in the bottom left hand corner of the browser, you'll see the 102 at the end of it. So that's all this is going to do. Right then, I'll go back to the jobs list because everything will spring into life. Tower has, as you may have noticed from early parts in the demonstration, an automatically updating um, WebSockets interface. So, I'll hit enter over here. Watch on the left, the web app job followed by the deploy job. Tower will kick in and should deploy to our three hosts. Two of them are already up and running, so they will just get a code update, but one of them has the full application to deploy. Let's go and watch this. OK, 
okay our web app dev check job is running and in fact Jenkins is not as fast as tower it's moving on to the deployment job which has triggered the deployment in tower I can drill into this and watch the job running let's do that We can see that Jenkins is still reporting the job as running. You may have noticed that on the tower CLI command that I listed in there, there was minus minus monitor switch. That means that tower CLI will continually poll the API of tower and report the status of what's happening. So if I looked into the job running here and looked at the standard out, I would see the output from the tower CLI. Okay, so our Deployment has finished in 31 seconds. We can see that it's hitting three hosts. All greens mean that nothing was needed to be done. That was already there. Orange means something has changed. So, for example, the first part, ensuring our packages were installed and the directory for the uh, application to be deployed to, already present on our first two hosts, but needed to be done on our number three host. But all hosts needed the application artifact downloading and on archiving and we go along restart services etc so if i go and refresh each of these browser pages we've got our new code on host one our new code on host two and host three should be up and running with our new code and that is how ansible be simple glue for a number of components.